Let's talk about adding life to your shots in 3D. This is the before and after. As you can see, one has much more dynamic lighting, composition, and overall just visual interest. Tip number one is the gobo technique. Light gobos are small, often metal plates with patterns or shapes cut into them, traditionally used in theater or stage lighting. Light gobos can serve to enhance lighting by projecting patterns or textures into a set. They create dynamic lighting effects and make sets appear larger and more immersive than they actually are. In our case, we want to cast lighting into our scene that suggests a tree outside the set is casting interesting shadows. This is pretty common wherever you have trees and sunlight, obviously. In fact, the same effect is happening right here in front of me on my desk, which I can show you. And if I step outside into my backyard, it's just happening everywhere. Of course, we don't want to create a full on tree. That's just unnecessary work in our case, since we won't even see it. And that would just add a ton of extra geometry as well. What we can do is add a spotlight with shift A to add and then light and select spot. We can position this light to come in through the window like it's direct sunlight. The power is just the brightness of the light. Radius is kind of like the softness. A smaller number will have harsher shadows, but we'll mess with the radius in a minute. The spot size is the angle of coverage. A bigger number just means the light covers more area. The blend factor is just how much it blends or fades at the edges. Now for our custom gobo, we could just add a picture of tree leaves. But the cool thing about working in CG though, is we can have video gobos for a more authentic look. Here's a video I took simply in my backyard with my phone. I just set my phone down looking up at the tree and let it record the leaves for a while. There was a slight breeze, which was nice. You could try to do this handheld, but it'll look better if you just set down the phone so the video isn't moving around. Now take this video file, select your light and blender and open the shader editor. Make sure you check use nodes so it knows we plan on working in here. Now take that video file, again mine was just set up on my phone, and drag it and drop it into this window. It should by default come over as a movie file. Blender supports most video formats, but mine happens to be an MOV. That's just what my phone took. You can also do an image sequence. It'll tell you the amount of frames it plays for and where it starts. If you have a few seconds of you setting up your camera, you can cut that out by offsetting by that number of frames. Now. Check on cyclic and auto refresh and we're almost done. Make sure it's plugged into the emission node for the light source and now we need to map it with the node wrangler add-on enabled that comes with Blender. Just press control T and that'll add a mapping and texture coordinate node. Basically how we can tell the movie texture how it's applied to the light source. Instead of using UVs or automatically generating this, we want to use normals. The normal direction of the light is just the direction in which it's casting light into the scene. You might need to change the location. In my case, 0.5 on both the X and Y seem to center my texture on the light. Now to see what you're doing, you might have to increase the power of your light source. You can also add a map range node to increase the brightness of your video or expand its range. It also desaturates it, which is nice. We're not creating a movie projector. We just want to mess with the light. So I set my max to 50. Before, it went from a power of zero in the darkest areas to a power of one in the really bright spots. Now it goes from zero way beyond one at a power of 50. Almost like cheating more dynamic range into our limited phone footage. Play with these numbers because your video will no doubt be different than mine. If you need more contrast, you can drop down a color ramp node before the map range and just play with clamping for your shadows. Now remember that radius setting can help soften up our light source just enough to give it that visual recognition we're looking for. In my scene with my video, a value of around 0.02 to 0.03 meters seemed to work pretty well. Now, when we render a sequence, we get this awesome lighting effect. Okay, so that's it for tip number one. Our next one is all about camera operation. Too many times I see a beautiful scene and it looks like this. Hundreds of frames, but every one of them looks essentially the same. It's just wasted render time. 
Let's talk about two types of camera motion, intentional and unintentional. Intentional camera movement is orchestrated movement. In 3D, you are the camera operator. The good news is instead of forking out thousands of dollars for steady cam rigs and dollies and cranes, you have it all in Blender by default. Just go up to Edit Preferences and in your add-ons, search for camera rigs. This, like many add-ons, comes with Blender. What you get is a few new options when you add a camera, a dolly camera, and a crane. Both camera systems come with a set of controls. Let's start with the dolly. To enter the controls, just select them and press Control Tab which goes into pose mode. I'll split my view into two. On the right side, you see my full scene through the view of my camera, and on the left, it's just my 3D viewport where I'm playing with the controls. This first control is where the camera is aimed. This is really handy because we can move the camera as if it were on a dolly track, but we can maintain a point of focus. In this case, the burger on the table. Now this other handle is the actual camera control. The one at the base here just moves the entire rig for further customization. So if I aim at the burger and go to frame one and keyframe the controls position, then go to the last frame and keyframe a new position, it'll look something like this. Now Blender automatically adds an easing curve to animations. We can see this by going to the graph editor and we see the camera motion kind of eases in and slows to a stop. Now it's certainly possible for a human camera operator to do this, but something a little more common for this type of movement in my opinion might be a constant motion as if we're cutting to a shot that's already moving. So to set that, just select everything with A, and in the graph editor, right click, and under interpolation, set it to linear. Now that movement is constant, it's subtle, and it looks like this. Again, compare this to before. The crane rig is very similar, but it gives us two additional controls. These arms aren't meant to be moved with their location, but instead you can keyframe their scale. Some pretty interesting results here, and I encourage you to play around with both of these. Keep in mind real practical camera operators and see if there are some tips from their craft in the real world that you can learn from. This next tip, number three, is all about unintentional camera motion. I love this free tool by Ian Hubert and Nathan Vagdahl. It's called Camera Shakeify, and I'll link it in the description. Amazingly, like I said, it's free, and what it'll do is add an extra set of options in your camera settings, even cameras you already have hooked up to a rig, like these rigs that we have. You just hit the plus button in your camera options here and choose from a menu of different types of camera shake and adjust the influence, scale, and speed. With a lot of these, unless you're in an intense situation, you might end up just turning that influence down. In my case, I'll use really subtle motion to give the shot a slight touch of imperfection, as if the camera is still on a smooth track, but as we know, nothing in the real world is perfect, so there's just a little bit of friction or bumpiness or hand motion affecting the otherwise very smooth shot. Small little touch here, but obviously in other scenes they could require more intense camera motion. It's really up to you as the artist to decide where and when you want to use this. That's it for the three tips. As a bonus tip, I parented a spotlight to a plane and animated the plane as if it was a door kind of swinging open and slowly closing shut. Uh, the spotlight just has a noise texture. It's so subtle, but it kind of mimics the bright sun reflection that you might see shooting across a room when like a glass door is opened. I didn't have to texture the door or anything like that because again, it's off camera. But as you can see, it communicates to the viewer that something is happening in the scene and ultimately can help bring it to life. It's fun to play around with light and there are so many things that I'm sure you'll come up with that I haven't even thought about. For a detailed uncut look at how I modeled both the straight and curved seating in the scene, check out my website, offworlddepot.com. I opted to build my own site over Patreon to have more control and support fellow artists. In this video, I recorded the entire process of modeling, 
texturing, baking, and optimizing these assets. It obviously supports me. I left my full-time job as a 3D artist to pursue this, and whether or not you subscribe, I'm happy with that choice. It's been awesome for me, my family, and my business. That said, I have a really crazy goal of 500 subscribers over there. I even made a little progress bar that you can go check out to see how we're doing on that goal. And that could mean some pretty cool things for this channel. Less client work for me and more of me just spending my time creating videos for you, tutorials, and trying to pass on the knowledge that I have. More assets as well. So you can think of this like a self-sponsored video. And I have no shame in saying it really helped me if you went and subscribed. Not just me, but you get that uncut, really raw content to watch and learn from as well. All right, so until next time, thanks for watching.